Good morning. I know, we're, we're shocking everybody. We're actually starting on time. All right, as we get to our seats, we're going to open up in a word of prayer. And um, I'll have a little bit more to say in a little bit here, but man, it has been a good week. A busy and crazy week with UPS, but it's a good week. We, had, we average about 40 kids every night, and so... We pray to the Lord for that, praying that the Lord allowed some seeds to be planted and that um, whether it leads to salvation or maybe to some of our boys and girls or the ones that were here serving the Lord to some capacity. So let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer today. Father in heaven, Lord, as we come before you today, Father, I just want to stop and thank you. Lord, I thank you so much for this last week. Father, for Lord, every single one of the boys and girls that you brought to us, Father, I pray that you will continue to put your hand upon their lives, Lord, use them in a great and mighty way. Father, I also want to thank you so much for this church, Lord, for everyone who has helped, has been praying for, and, and even those who came out every night, Lord, for the as exhausted as some of them were, Lord, the strength that you gave them. Father, I pray that you will just continue to use us for your great glory and honor. Lord, please be with our services today. Father, as we worship you, as we fellowship, as brothers and sisters in Christ, and Lord, as we dive into your word, God, above all else, we pray that Jesus Christ will be glorified. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. I wouldn't be too surprised if some of you could actually quote verses 1 through 6 with me. Some of those are very, very familiar, but man, they have a wonderful message to them. John 14. Jesus is speaking here. He says, Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it weren't so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. In that day, you will know that I am in my that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Judas, not a spirit, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me 
does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. You heard that I said to you, I go away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. And I have told you before it happens, so that when it happens, you may believe. I will not speak much more with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. But so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up. Let us go from here. Let's go ahead and stand as we say our memory verse for the month, and then we will praise and worship our great God this morning. All together, John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, John 1, 12.
except for all those who were at VBS this week, kids. Come on, Karis, Lydia, Zach, Josiah, Titus, Josh, come on, Gavin, come on, Hudson.
So I want to thank you uh, for allowing me to come speak with you this morning. Just kind of update you real quick on um, my ministry at Black Horse Academy. So I'm home for the summer. I'm, I'm a high school English teacher, so I'm on school holidays just like your children are. So I go back to school soon as well. So I want to thank you for this opportunity to come and do a quick update on my ministry. I continue to serve at Black Forest Academy, where I am a secondary English teacher, specifically working with grade 12, advanced placement English, and then also as the department chair for English. So I oversee all the English teachers and the curriculum. And Black Forest Academy provides a quality international Christian education mainly for the children of missionaries who are serving in Europe, North Africa, over um, some even in Asia, Southeast Asia. Um, we do have non-MKs as well at Black Horse Academy. We seek to equip our students to influence their world through biblical thought, character, and action. So um, we're hoping that when they leave um, Black Horse Academy, they will be an influence on their world wherever they go. With your faithful support, um, I have like, this really interesting experience because um, some of my missionary colleagues are like, what? You don't have to travel? Um, I live in Miriam, that way, and um, so um, when I come home to do my missionary reports, it's like going to home churches um, because I know people in this church, I've known many of you for a long time, and so um, it's not like I'm going to places I don't know people. Um, I get up on Sunday morning and I drive from my parents' house. The farthest I go is South Whitley. Um, so some of my colleagues this summer are traveling from the East Coast of the United States to the West Coast of the United States. Um, I feel blessed that um, my churches are family and that you are so close. So I appreciate your longevity. You've been with me uh, very close to the beginning of my ministry. I'm going back August 6th, hopefully. And um, that would be my 29th year working at Black Force Academy, and you've been with me uh, a large part of that time. So I want to thank you for your faithful support and many years. Um, so some of the questions I've been asked. So I've been back, I was here two years ago, um, right when things started out, those fun things that started two years ago. Um, I've had a lot of people ask me, I have two big questions people have been asking me all summer, so I'm just going to answer them. Um, one is, what was COVID like in Germany? And the second one is, how does the war in Ukraine affect us? Because um, that's, people know that we're kind of close to Ukraine. So number one, how was COVID? It was the same as it was here. Um, we had, um, we went to remote schooling uh, my first year back. Um, Black Force Academy, because we're a boarding school, we were blessed in that we could still, uh, eventually we could go back to kind of in-person schooling because they're all together in the dorm. So if they're remote learning, they're together. If they're in school, they're together. So, but our German neighbors, um, in our town, their school, their kids didn't go to school for an entire year. Um, they didn't have a remote learning system in place, and they didn't have computers, um, uh, technology in place. So um, think about your kids are doing remote learning here. Uh, the German kids in our neighborhood had no school for an entire year. And so that was a really hard thing for them, and it was also caused a lot of tension between Black Force Academy and our neighbors because they couldn't understand why our kids were coming to school and like they lived together, 20 of them in a dorm together. So. What's the difference? So that was a um, problem. We just dropped our COVID regulations in February of this year. Um, so like we've been wearing masks and had restricted things until February. So it's been going, his Germans do rules really well. They, if there's a rule, we will follow it. So um, that's been a strain on our community, but we're like, we're back to normal pretty much. We're getting there. The other thing is the war in the Ukraine. So we're seeing a lot of the same things you're hearing, seeing here. We're, our prices are going up in the grocery store just like here. Um, are, we're being affected by um, a lot of our grain comes in from the Ukraine. So flour is rationed right now in Germany. Um, oil is rationed, like uh, cooking oil, uh, yeast. So there's a lot of things that are rationed right now. Uh, so I think the toilet paper craze of early COVID here, that's what's like in Germany now. If you get more than one bag of flour, you're like shamed. Um, our gas comes in from, and oil comes in from Russia. So the war in Ukraine is causing prices to reach to go up. Uh, we've already been told that the heat's going to be off most of the winter. Um, as far as like the very low heat, and so I'm buying my Long Johns, and yeah, going to be all ready for Larry this winter and ready to go because uh, we can't um, expect to have oil. So that's a pre-request. Um, it's how will we do school with lowered um, energy, lower heat. 
But I'm excited. I think um, my ministry is going really well. Um, I'm working with a great group of kids, a great group of staff, and I want to thank you for partnering with me. Um, your, uh, I, have a, I have a church that has a brand new pastor um, that just came on um, this summer. And when I went to speak there, he said, and so tell me why we support you at all because you're not a, a, fr a frontline missionary. I went, ooh, okay. I'm gonna explain this for a while, but so here we go. We are in a partnership relationship. Um, so yeah, education is not uh, translating the Bible, and it's not planning churches, but um, there are a lot of missionaries who have high school students that um, those missionaries have been working a long time to build language skills, and relationship skills. Um, they have uh, put a lot of work into establishing their ministry, but their most important thing to them is their children. And so when it comes time to educate their children, if they're in an area where um, both parents are working and they can't homeschool, or if they're in an area like Germany where it's illegal to homeschool, they have to have an option. So it's either leave the field or send your children to a school like Black Forest Academy. So when you partner with me, we are partnering with a lot of missionaries who would have to leave the field to educate their kids. So we are in support ministry, and so like that's, that's a valuable part of your support of me is to support those missionaries. So I want to thank you for um, taking the jump for a non-traditional missionary and to um, support education because working with children, um, I'm excited. I was watching um, your, your vacation Bible school pictures all week. Um, I was having fun with Cougarburra Coast even though I wasn't here. Um, it's exciting to see um, how much good news builds into children of this area because building into children with your youth group and with um, your children's ministries, that puts a huge impact on the future in ministry. And so that's my job as well as to work with students who will be, um, we have kids working in the United Nations, we have kids who are lawyers, we have kids who are doctors, we have kids who are parents who are homeschooling their kids now, that come out of my classes and we are having an impact on the kingdom through that. So I just want to thank you for that and um, yeah, thank you. I'll be in the back if you have questions for me later. I'd love to talk to you before I head off um, today. Thank you, Pastor. It's been great getting to hear some of those updates from our missionaries and also being able to uh, support our missionaries in that way. Uh, and being a teacher, I think it's great to support other teachers around the world. Uh, let's go ahead and take a, a look at our bulletin uh, for today. Our events of the week. Um, there is youth group tonight. We haven't had that in the bulletin lately, but um, do show up for youth group tonight. Kids, come have fun. Uh, Wednesday prayer meeting uh, should be a regular one this week, 6 p.m. Uh, Golden group, there's an announcement there for Thursday, August 4th. Um, I have a note, right? <laughs> Uh, says Golden Group will be meeting at the Heavener's Lake House on Thursday the 4th. Uh, meet at the church at 11.15 uh, and we'll take the church van and carpool. Lunch is going to be provided, but bring some lawn chairs. Oh, they have a lot of lawn chairs there this evening. But I imagine the weather will be awful, it's cloudy. No. <laughs> uh, it's always a great time at the lake house, so if you guys get an opportunity to go to that, uh, do uh, take that up. Uh, it's yeah, a great time for fellowship for you guys. Um, other uh, big thing on there is baptism two weeks from today, uh, Sunday, August 7th, 3 p.m. at Boston Pond. I uh, bring lawn chairs, uh, mosquito spray probably, right? Um, lots of mosquito spray and an appetite because there's always some good finger foods and desserts, ice cream, uh, and uh, we have two, three, three so far. So if you guys are or know of anyone in here who needs about baptism, um, have them come speak to the pastor. So we have three lined up for right now. Uh, that's a great thing to be able to celebrate and experience that with them. Uh, other notes on there, again, um, thank you to all who showed up and helped with BBS. It was a great week, uh, and to cap it all off, we got to watch Pastor eat some crickets. So <laughs> you've been able to floss all those out. Right. I hope so. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Mindy's like, he doesn't, you know. So. Um, prayer sheet on the inside. Um, I don't have any updates on the sheet on the inside. Um, does anyone have any updates on that? I did have one prayer request in our Sunday school. Um, this is Wagner's grandpa. 
right? Claire, uh, Claire's grandpa, right? Kind of hurt himself a little bit. He's got a shoulder injury that's starting to nag him a little bit. Uh, so do pray for him uh, as he's uh, looking for a recovery for that. So anyone else have any updates on the prayer list? All right, thank you. So we stand and sing anywhere with Jesus. <laughs>
take your Bibles and go with me to the book of Philemon. The book of Philemon. In fact, 
the world really sees forgiving people as those who are weak. But yet it portrays those who refuse to forgive as the strong ones, those who have real character. But for us, as God's children, an unwillingness to forgive should be unthinkable. See, we're to forgive others because God's forgiven us. We have several verses in Scripture that remind us of that. Oh, I apologize. I got my cue in. There you go. Now you can do it, right? There, if we were to go through Scripture, I believe there's four different results that can occur when we have a failure to forgive. The first one that we see is that a failure to forgive imprisons you in your past. See, your lack of forgiveness, it keeps that pain alive. It, it, it keeps the wound open, never allowing it to heal. And we are to constantly be on the guard, always to prevent any seed of sin from ever growing deep within us. But a lack of forgiveness will do just that. It will imprison you. But secondly, not only will it imprison you in your past, a lack of forgiveness produces bitterness. You say, okay, what's the big deal? Bitterness, it's not just a sin. It's an infection. In, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, the writer says, See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many are, many be defiled. See, forgive and forget, it's not possible. It's not biblical. Forgiveness is a choice. Failure to forgive turns into anger, and then it turns into bitterness. But you know the sad thing? Bitterness never hurts the other person. Now, maybe if you're going to take it a step farther and you want to go exact vengeance on somebody for something they've done, yeah, that might cause harm. But bitterness, being hurt and angry over something and unwilling to forgive somebody for what they've done to you, it destroys you. Bitterness never hurts the other person. It, it distorts your whole outlook on life. See, forgiveness, on the other hand, it replaces bitterness with love. It says, you know what? I didn't deserve Jesus Christ to forgive me. And knowing what he's done for me, I want to have that same love, even for the person who intentionally, unintentionally, doesn't matter who's done me wrong, no matter how much it hurts. It frees you. Kind of like that first point there. It doesn't keep you entrapped in a prison of hate and frustration and bitterness. It also... Uh, Forgiveness replaces that bitterness with true joy. Because then you realize this hurt, but I'm able to forgive because of what he's done for me. I, I can't forgive on my own without Jesus Christ. But because of him, I can have joy in knowing that I can respond the right way in what the world would see as an impossible situation. It gives me peace. I mean, I would really go through all the different fruits of the Spirit and talk about how forgiveness replaces bitterness with so much greater things. Third, unforgiveness gives the devil an open door. It, it, it's almost like it's an invitation to come on in. See, Paul was warning, when he wrote to the Ephesians, he said, be angry, and yet don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, and don't give the devil an opportunity. And even when he wrote to the Corinthians, he says, Whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if you've forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ, in order, here's why I forgive, that no advantage be taken of us by Satan. For we're not ignorant of his schemes. It's no exaggeration to say that most of the ground that Satan gains in our lives is due to unforgiveness or a lack of forgiveness. See, if love fulfills the law towards others, a lack of love violates it. And unforgiveness is a lack of love. Forgiveness blocks that avenue of demonic attack. Be loving by being willing to forgive. Fourth, a lack of forgiveness hinders our fellowship with God. See, Jesus warned us, if you forgive men their, for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. 
But if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Now that's not saying that he's going to take back our salvation. It's not a reference to the completed past forgiveness that takes place when we get saved. It's a reference to the ongoing relational forgiveness with others. See, sin in the life of a believer forfeits fellowship with God. And it is critical that we understand you cannot be right with God if you're not willing to forgive others. Forgiveness restores a believer to the place of maximum blessing from the Lord. It further restores the purity and joy of fellowship with God. So it's no surprise that the importance of forgiveness is a constant theme in Scripture. You know, there are at least 75 different word pictures about forgiveness in the Bible, and they help us grasp the importance, the nature, even the effects of forgiveness. You know, to give you just a few word pictures that kind of open your eyes to what forgiveness really is and what it does. To forgive is to turn the key, open the cell door, and let the prisoner walk free. But they deserve to be in that cell. So did you and I. To forgive is to write in big, large letters across a debt, canceled. That's what Jesus Christ did with his blood. He canceled our debt. To forgive is to pound the gavel in the courtroom and declare not guilty. Even though God of heaven knows exactly how guilty we are. We've been justified. We've been legally declared righteous because of Jesus Christ. See, to forgive is to bundle up all the garbage and the trash and dispose of it, leaving the house clean and fresh. To forgive is to grant a full pardon to a condemned criminal. It's to sandblast the wall full of graffiti, leaving it looking like new. Forgiveness is important to God. Therefore, it ought to be important to you and I. You know, God devotes an entire book of the Bible here to forgiveness. And in these 25 verses, the spiritual duty to forgive is emphasized. But it's not emphasized here in principle. It's not emphasized in a parable or even in word pictures. This is a real-life situation involving two people that were very dear to Paul. And he's teaching the importance of forgiving others. <coughs> now, the first three verses uh, we start with are the introduction here to the letter. And, and turn there with me now, if you're not already there, to verses 1 through 3. I want to read them again. Paul says... Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, and then two, who he's writing the letter to, first, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul starts the letter here with his name. And if you're Philemon, Philemon probably got a little excited when he opened that and he saw Paul's name. He was the one who had led him to Christ. You know, that name alone would have compelled Philemon to read on eagerly. And what a privilege. Paul took time to write me a letter. Little did he know that this letter was going to become one of the 66 books of the Bible. Only Timothy and Titus were privileged to actually receive a personal letter from Paul that turned into a book of the Bible. Now, Paul describes himself interestingly here. He calls himself a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Now, when I first, uh, the Lord laid it on my heart that, to go through the book of Philemon, I went. And if you go to the book of Romans, and then the first and second Corinthians, then Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, then first and second Thessalonians, then first and second Timothy, then Titus, and then Philemon, all of Paul's letters, most of his letters have a very similar introduction to it. But this is the only place that he describes himself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Sometimes he refers to himself as a servant, but here he calls himself a prisoner. You know, sometimes Paul would open his letters stressing his apostleship and even emphasizing his authority. But in this letter, Paul's not trying to emphasize authority. He's appealing gently and very singularly to a friend. A dear brother. See, even though Paul was in prison in Rome, Paul viewed himself as being a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Because it was for the sake of Christ, and it was by God's will, that he was a prisoner. See, by mentioning his imprisonment, though, Paul's making kind of a subtle appeal, I believe, to Philemon. And, and he's, he sets up his case by, in essence, saying, you know, I'm struggling here in prison. It is a hard task. 
Finally, do you think that there's something you could take care of for me? And it's almost like he's comparing. It's like, hey, I'm I'm suffering here in prison. Surely it wouldn't be too much to ask me ask me to do this small thing, Philemon. See, Paul, he, he knew that Paul had suffered for the cause of Christ. And that knowledge surely had an effect on his willingness to do whatever Paul was going to ask of him. Now, Timothy is mentioned, not because he's a co-author of this letter, but for a few different reasons. One, uh, I believe he knew Philemon. I believe they, they had come to know each other because of Paul's ministry. And Paul describes him as our brother. Uh, and Timothy had been with Paul in Ephesus, where Philemon, that's probably where they, they met, where Philemon met Paul for the first time. But by mentioning Timothy, you know, Paul here is trying to set up Timothy. You know, he identified Timothy as an equal, not because, well, he's just grown so much and he's even better than I am than uh, being the apostle of Paul. No, it had nothing to do with who they were as individuals. As we study through the book of 1 Corinthians, back to the start of it, Paul had to deal with some factions. It doesn't matter about Apollos or me or Peter. We serve Jesus Christ. That's what makes us equal. Just because I may have the great honor and privilege of having the title pastor, it doesn't guarantee that I'm somehow a better Christian than any single one of you. It doesn't make me better. Now, it is a great privilege and an honor that I pray that God gives me the strength and, and the right heart to do for his glory and honor, but we serve together, and if we're equally serving, that's what should be the focus. But Paul's trying to kind of indicate he's going to be passing the baton of spiritual leadership on to Timothy, and he wanted to recognize him as uh, the a young man who was serving the Lord just as fervently as Paul had. So then we get to who the letter is written to. We get Philemon here. Now, we talked about this a little bit last week, but Philemon was a very wealthy guy. He lived in Colossae. The Colossian church actually met and gathered at his house. And he was very active in his Christian service. Now, Paul uses the word beloved here. It's a familiar description that Paul used of individuals in groups that he knew very well. But then he calls them a beloved and fellow worker, meaning I know that you have been serving the Lord right alongside me. Even though we may not have been in the same place, we're doing the same job. We have the same goal here. You're a fellow worker. Now, Paul actually never visited Colossae, which is interesting. So their friendship obviously developed an emphasis, but the remainder of their friendship was a long-distance type of friendship. And they didn't have common means of technology that let us reach out and contact people today. But yet Paul still knew about this man's service because he heard about it all the time. He kept hearing about how faithful and how a wonderful servant of the Lord Philemon was. That brought great joy to Paul, knowing, man, God, you not only let me have the great opportunity of showing and leading to you, but he's got the same love for you, and you're using him in a great way. Paul didn't sit back and he's like, yeah, Lord, I, I brought you another good one. Paul was just like, man, Lord, thank you for letting me have a part in this man's life. And so, out of this deep friendship, he writes in this letter, and Paul's trusting that their friendship and their love for the Lord is going to result in forgiveness and reconciliation between Philemon and Onesimus. Now, it's interesting that the letter's also addressed, though, to Aphia, who was Philemon's wife, and Archippus, who undoubtedly was their son. Now, Paul describes Archippus as a fellow soldier, which shows he also was actively involved in the ministry. Also named in the dress, though, is the church that meets in your house, Philemon. See, Philemon may have been the main person who was being addressed, but this would have an impact on his wife and his son because, I mean, to a certain degree, Onesimus was their slave, too. And it's going to have an impact because the church meets at your house. So how you respond... It could easily unite the church just as easily as it could divide the church. Now, though Philemon is a private letter that Paul's writing, Paul wanted it read to the church. See, this would be a wonderful teaching tool on the importance of forgiveness for every single one of them. But it could also be used to kind of help Philemon be accountable. And I know that's something that we don't always enjoy, but you'd be a fool to admit that I don't need accountability. We all need it. We all have the type of relationship as brothers and sisters in 
Christ, where we're not trying to keep each other accountable. We're not each other's police officer. Oh, have you been doing this? Oh, did you do this? No. It should be more. Hey, how are you doing? How's your relationship with the Lord going right now? Saying it out of genuine concern and love. We all need that. Of course, Paul then gives what but in some way it could be his standard greeting by saying grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That appears in all 13 of his epistles. And, and here's something cool. See, grace, not getting, or no, getting something we don't deserve, grace is the means of salvation. You know what peace is? It's the result. See, the linking here of God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ is also wonderful because this is just another testament to the Trinity, to Jesus, God the Son, God the Father, and even God the Spirit all being equal. Now, these first three verses are the introduction to this letter of forgiveness. And for the remainder of our time today, I want us to consider the character of someone who forgives. That should be true for all of us. See, the first concern that a forgiving person has is a concern for the Lord. A concern for the Lord. Starting there in verse 4, he says, I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus. See, Paul begins the main body of this letter by praising Philemon. But it wasn't Paul's intent to flatter him or build him up. Paul knew something that should be true for us. Legitimate praise to someone who's doing the service to the Lord with the right heart attitude, when you praise a person like that, you know what it causes them to do? It's like, you know what? I've been blessed to be able to do this. I want to go out and do it even more. <clears throat> Legitimate praise to someone who's genuinely serving results in further desire to serve the Lord. See, Paul's, or Philemon's virtuous character is the foundation that Paul is basing his appeal for him to forgive a messiness upon. See, Paul knew firsthand of Philemon's character. He, having been God's chosen tool to bring him to Christ, and having worked with him, Philemon's pastor at Colossae was also with Paul in Rome, and he too could testify about Philemon, as could Onesimus. And that combined testimony, along with others he heard from, it caused Paul to say, I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers. I'm always, when I pray, I'm so thankful when, when I take a moment just to thank God for you, because as much as you're being a blessing and being used, you're a blessing to me, Philemon. Paul doesn't, we don't see any correction of Philemon in this book. There's no suggestion of anything that was wrong in his life. Everything Paul heard about Philemon was good. There's no threatening language in this letter that we might assume Paul felt forgiving Onesimus was going to be difficult. But rather, you almost get the impression that Paul is just anticipating the response, the right response that Philemon will give. Now, the first characteristic of one who forgives is this concern for the Lord. Paul had heard of the faith which Philemon had toward the Lord Jesus. See, as a genuine believer, Philemon was concerned about the Lord and desired to please him. Because the Lord had forgiven him, he could forgive others. See, conviction from the indwelling Holy Spirit, from the Word of God, also provided motivation for Philemon to do what was right. And it's interesting. Because he says, you know, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you, you have. Now that's interesting. It's in the present tense. And Paul is acknowledging that Philemon has been continuously concerned about the Lord. His unwavering faith gave Paul confidence that he'd be willing to forgive. Turn with me to Romans chapter 3 real quick. Romans chapter 3. We are supposed to forgive because we are reconciled to Jesus Christ when we get saved. Unbelievers, they don't have that capacity. See, Paul points out here in Romans chapter 3, starting verse 10, hopefully some familiar verses here to you, but he says, as it's written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There's none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together, they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. Those who are controlled by bitterness find it very difficult, if not impossible, to forgive. And we must never allow that to have a place in our lives. We're to root it out before it consumes and corrupts us. 
We do this first and foremost because we love the Lord and we're concerned with serving and honoring Him. But consequently, as the rest of verse 5 says there, we also do it because we're concerned about people. We're concerned. We have a genuine concern for other people. That last phrase there, or that, that next phrase there in verse 5, and toward all the saints. See, the first part of the verse, love, goes with this last phrase as well, because it's not only a love and concern for the Lord, it's a love towards all the saints. We can't have a true concern for the Lord before we experience that love from Him. However, we're not to receive that love and then do nothing with it. We're to allow it to permeate our lives. And we're to show that love towards everyone, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. I remember it said, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians. Because they can't even show the love that they boast about to one another. See, the love he's talking about here is that God-like agape love. It's the love of will and choice. It's one of self-sacrifice with humility. See, love is a fruit of the Spirit. It's a manifestation of genuine saving faith because its source is now in the believer, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Philemon's faith was real because it manifested itself in true love for other people. Philemon's concern for people gave him the ability to forgive. You want to be a forgiving person? You do it first and foremost because you love the Lord. But secondly, you do it because you want to show that love to people. But if a forgiving person has a concern for people, then it goes without saying that he or she will have a concern for fellowship. See, looking at verse 6, Paul goes on to pray, I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective. Real faith and real love will inevitably result in a concern for fellowship. Now, there's no place in the body of Christ for individualism. Concern for fellowship was a motivation for Philemon to forgive Onesimus because failing to do so would lead to a rift in the fellowship. Since Onesimus may have left an unbeliever, but he's coming back now a brother in Christ. So by forgiving him, Philemon would not only be acting in accordance with his love for the Lord and love for people, but it would maintain that harmony and unity and peace within the Colossian church. Now the word koinonia is the word we get fellowship from, but it's very difficult at times to render it precisely in English. It's usually translated fellowship, but it really means much more than merely enjoying one another's company. It refers to a mutual sharing of all life. It could even maybe be translated better at times as belonging to. Believers belong. We belong to each other in a mutual partnership that is produced by our faith in Christ. See, by forgiving Onesimus, Philemon would then acknowledge that he belonged to him as a brother in Christ. That's interesting. Paul uses the word effective there. It comes from the Greek word energis. Energy, power. The word effective there is maybe better understood to mean powerful. See, such an act of forgiveness would send a very powerful message to the church about the importance of forgiveness, the importance of fellowship, even between slaves and masters. See, forgiveness truly is powerful because it makes a strong statement, not just to the one who forgives and the one who's forgiven, but everybody who knows about it. It has an impact. Of course, that leads us into our next concern for a forgiving person. And that's a concern for knowledge. I say, knowledge? What do you mean, Pastor? Well, Paul goes on there in verse 6. He says, through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you. Paul, when he wrote to the Ephesians, said something that I'm sure we would all agree with, right? Do you believe God has blessed you? Amen? Paul said, we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We have a new nature within us. How then is Philemon to discover every good thing which was in him? Well, the word for knowledge here refers to a deep, rich, and very full, but experiential knowledge. Say, what do you mean? It's the knowledge 
that comes through the personal experience and acquaintance with the truth. Philemon could read of forgiveness. He could have heard sermons about forgiveness. But until he forgave, he could have no experiential knowledge of it. See, by forgiving Onesimus, he would actually experience that good thing in him that came from the Lord. By walking in obedience to God's will, believers experience good things that God has placed within us. See, book knowledge doesn't come close to experience. Now, it's thrilling to grasp the truth from Scripture intellectually, but it's so much more exciting to live out that truth in everyday life. See, practicing the truth of Scripture leads us into that type of knowledge that Paul's talking about, which brings about spiritual maturity. It is wonderful to understand what it means to trust God, but it's so much more wonderful when you experience that power in your life, when you've trusted Him with no strength of your own. See, Paul was confident that Philemon would want to experience a true knowledge of forgiveness in this situation with Onesimus. Paul gives both Philemon and us a very gentle reminder of the importance of a concern for that knowledge that we can experience. I don't want to just know about God. I want to know Him experientially. You know how I do that? I take the things He's written to me and I apply them to my life. I practice them. Even as we read this morning, several times in John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you spend time in God's word every day, praise the Lord. But when you close that book, do you practice the things you've read? Do you talk with the Lord continually throughout the day? Lord, how can I take that scripture and apply it to my life? Or where can I practice this so I can gain that experience and know you and fully be blessed by you even more? That ought to be our desire. <clears throat> of course, the next concern is one we're always to strive for. It's the ultimate purpose of our life. We have a concern for God's glory. See that last phrase in verse 6 there. For Christ's sake. That shouldn't require much explanation. The Christian life with all of its joys with all of its duties and responsibilities, it's all for Christ's sake. Amen? Well, the text literally reads here, and maybe in some cases could be translated, unto Christ. We're doing it as though we're doing it to Him. See, the goal of everything that we do as God's children should be for the glory of Jesus Christ. Someone who's devoted to Christ's glory will certainly forgive some of them as an unforgiving spirit doesn't bring glory to Christ, we ought to seek to forgive because we bring glory to Jesus Christ every time we get to practice forgiveness. We do. See, Paul was confident that things would be resolved the right way because he knew Philemon and now Ephesus, or Onesimus, they both <coughs> had desire to allow the situation to bring glory to God. Are you concerned with glorifying God with your life? You should be. Of course, the next one and the last one here, it goes hand in hand with each of these other concerns. But it's a concern to be a blessing. Look at verse 7. For I've come to have much joy and comfort in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Philemon had a reputation for his love. It was a fact that we've already talked about, but it's a fact that brought Paul a lot of joy and comfort. Much joy and comfort, he says. See, through Philemon, the hearts of other believers, of the saints, had been refreshed. And the word that's used here for hearts, I couldn't help but bring this up, but it, it is a reference to the center of feelings or emotions. I don't know if you've heard this bit, but Mark Lowry once did this in one of his comedy routines he was talking about. You know how we say, I love you with all my heart? <laughs> well, technically, the word that he's using there, in Greek times and New Testament times, the word would not have been translated heart. It would have been bowels. How many of you have ever said to your, your husband or wife, I love you with all my bowels? <laughs> I love you with all of my colon? Of course not. Of course, he made the quip in there when he was saying, he's like, you know, I guess we could translate this way the next time you look at your sweetheart baby, you make my liver quiver. 
As funny as that may sound, though, see, the literal image here is that we're to love with all of our beings. See, it may sound nice to say with all of our hearts, but it means that we love unconditionally with everything because that's the way Jesus loves us. Now, there are people who are struggling. There's people who are suffering, suffering and hurting emotionally around us. And Philemon had become a refreshment to countless people in his day. That word, interestingly enough, is actually a military term. It was a term that would be used to describe of an army rest, resting after a long march. See, Philemon had brought many troubled people rest and renewal. He was a peacemaker. He was a man of instinctive kindness. That was a source of blessing to everyone. That kind of person Paul knew could be counted on to forgive. You want to be a forgiving person? Think about this. And I know I've said this many times, and hopefully if there's anything that is ingrained into your mind after today, if God can so tenderly forgive you, can you, just like from Philemon, have that same character that forgives others? Because you can honestly say, above all else, I'm concerned first and foremost with my Lord. I love him, and I want to keep his commandments. And as a result of that, I look at everybody around me and realize that God died for every single person here. So therefore, if God loves you that much, so should I. And because I love you, I want to have that fellowship with you. I, I, I want to have that experiential knowledge too. I don't want to just learn about God. I want to experience. I want to put it into practice in my life. I want it to be for God's glory. The ultimate purpose of your life, the ultimate reason God created you was so that your life would bring glory to Him. Does it? Are you a blessing? Because when you have the character of someone who's willing to forgive, and I'm not saying it's easy. We could talk about situations where maybe someone lost a family member to a drunk driver or a drive-by shooting. How, how do you forgive somebody like that? I'm not going to say it's easy. It's only possible for a believer. But as we started out saying, a lack of forgiveness results in so many horrible things. We don't forgive anybody because they deserve it. We don't forgive anybody because they're worthy. We forgive because he's forgiven us. Father in heaven, as we come before you now, I want to thank you for forgiving me. I want to thank you for forgiving each and every one of us who you so graciously and lovingly adopted into your family. Lord, you, you've justified and redeemed us. And I pray that you would, Lord, put a hedge of protection in each of our lives. Father, I pray that an unforgiving attitude and heart, Lord, that that would never be true of us. And Father, even as the devil attacks us, even as, Lord, you allow certain situations to happen that may cause us great pain, wondering, Lord, why, who says, as many might be tempted to question why you would do something. Father, would you humbly and lovingly remind us of your love for us? Thank you for that forgiveness. I pray that we will be forgiving too. We ask this in your precious and your most holy name. Amen. As Brother Arno comes to lead us in the closing hymn, how fitting we Without him, we can't forgive. We can't. Do you have him? And if so, are you relying upon history? Let's do it.